continue our study of the upper room discourse where Jesus is, is uh, speaking to his disciples. They started this conversation in the upper room as they, they shared in the Last Supper. And now as they make their way toward the Garden of Gethsemane, he continues to teach them and prepare them for what is ahead. And in John 16, verse 25, we read this. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language. An hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but will tell you plainly of the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will request of the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came forth from the Father. I came forth from the Father, and have come into the world. I am leaving the world again, and going to the Father. His disciples said, Lo, now you are speaking plainly, and are not using it figure of speech. Now we know that you know all things, and have no need for anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from God. And Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, an hour is coming, and has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the encouragement of your word. And we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful, powerful statement. A passage that reminds us that even though our lives are filled with troubles, Lord, you are all we need. We can look to you. And you have overcome the world. So I pray you would encourage us now as we we open your word and study these verses. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's a game that my kids have enjoyed playing since the time they were really young. Uh, it, and it's, it's, I guess I could say I've enjoyed playing it with them. Uh, but it's called, it's called uh, Trouble. Anybody play Trouble? <laughs> Trouble's a pretty simple game. You, you know, it's have a simple objective. You have these four game pieces. And, and you just need to move them all the way around the board. And get them back to the home space. Sounds simple. You roll the dice. Oh, five. Oh, five spaces. And there, there we are. There's this one little wrinkle. If another player lands on the same <coughs> space that your game piece is on, they send you back to the start. And you have to start it all over again. And usually, in my experience, I'm all, it's, it's what happens when I'm like all the way around and I have like two spaces left to get into that safe spot. And, and you can just see it in your kid's eyes. You know, they're rolling, the, they're counting in their mind. How many spaces they need. And when they get it, they're like, yeah. And they send you back, and you're like, but you didn't have to do that. You could have moved that piece. I know. <laughs> there, there's a similar game. It's almost the same. It's called Sorry, which I thought was a terrible name because nobody's sorry. <laughs> they're going to be sorry, right? I thought maybe a better name for both of them would be, I really don't like this game. It's frustrating, and I don't want to play it again. But that wouldn't fit on the box. And nobody would buy it. So we're stuck with trouble. Trouble. If there's one word that we might use to sum up our experience in this fallen world, you might use the word trouble. We all encounter different trials and tribulations and afflictions and struggles in the course of our lives. It is inevitable. No one is exempt. And our troubles might look very different from each other. We all have them. It's kind of like the game. Just when things seem to be going well, out of nowhere, troubles come and knock you off your feet. <coughs> we might face really big troubles. Or it just might be a lot of little troubles that seem to stack up and weigh down on our shoulders. If it's been a while since you've had a, a trouble enter your life, you know, brace yourself. It's coming. It knows your address. It knows where you live. Trouble has a way of finding us. And there are all different kinds of trials and tribulations that we face. It, it could be physical afflictions, just the aches and pains, or broken bones, or, or sickness. Maybe it's, it's family troubles, relationship problems, or work-related issues, financial troubles. Maybe it's, it's opposition that we face to our faith as we try to live out our faith and witness to others, and, and there's ridicule and, and perspective persecution, or general opposition. 
Maybe you've imagined that when you became a Christian that everything would just get better and easier and simpler in life and, and God would just take all those troubles away, but that's not how it works. If anything, Christians face a whole new set of struggles in addition to those everyday general trials and tribulations that everyone experiences. Now that's not meant to sound pessimistic. The Lord wants, though, to equip his people to face all of those adversities with courage. And that's what Jesus does here in our passage. He's equipping his disciples to face those troubles that they would experience in their lives. He's equipping them to face those things with courage. He knew what was waiting for him in the garden. He knew these were the very final moments that he would have to teach these men. <laughs> he knew that, that they would be scattered in a very short time. He knew, though, that they would see him again. After his resurrection, they would become his witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. And they would endure many trials and tribulations and troubles in the days ahead. To overcome, they would need to put their trust in him. And so these verses not only prepare these men, but they prepare us for the troubles that we will face in our lives. And we know from experience it's easy to get weighed down and discouraged and even to start to despair. But it seems like we're in the middle of a dark tunnel and we can't see the light on the other side. Maybe it seems at times as if we're being crushed by the burdens of this life. And that's why these words are so important for us to hear. We will make it through and the Lord will carry us through. We can overcome the trials and tribulations of life because Christ is sufficient for us no matter what we're going through. We see here in our passage, a number of things that we need to remember. When, when troubles come, you, you need to remember that you're not alone. And if we go back in our, in our passage here, verse 32, Jesus tells the disciples, Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone. And yet I'm not alone because the Father is with me. For years, these men had, had been faithfully by his side. But that night, Jesus tells them they were all going to fall away. And he quotes a passage from the Old Testament, or he, he refers back to a passage in, in Zechariah, which predicts, I will strike the shepherd and, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And, and that's exactly what would, would happen. He is the good shepherd. And he would be struck down and his sheep would be scattered. In just a, a short time, they would be praying in the garden, and they would see the torches in the distance coming closer and closer and closer, and it would be the leaders and the soldiers armed with swords, and, and when they showed up, they would take Jesus into custody, and Jesus wasn't going to fight back, Jesus wasn't going to resist, he would just hand himself over to them. And what did the disciples do? They, they would turn and run as quickly as they could in opposite directions to get out of there. Jesus said, you will all be scattered. I know that, that Jesus understood this was going to happen. He, he knew this was necessary. He cared about the safety of his disciples. But in his humanity, I imagine it must have really broken his heart that his closest friends in all the world would abandon him in that hour of need. Jesus would be all alone. There was no one to stand by his side, no one to defend him, no one to let him see him, no one to encourage, no one to say, I am there. <coughs> Eventually, Peter and John would stop running, and they would turn around and follow from a distance and stand there in the courtyard and watch the trial unfold from afar. But there was nothing they could do to help him. This was something he had to do all on his own. He was isolated and deserted, utterly forsaken. And yet he says, I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Jesus wasn't alone in his ordeal. The Father was with him. And the disciples were not alone as they ran for their lives. And in the days ahead, they would not be alone. When they were thrown into prison or when they were, were threatened by the leaders, they were not alone. He repeatedly told them that he was not going to abandon them. He was not going to leave them as orphans. He said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The same is true for us today. And that's something we need to remember when we're going through suffering and adversity and times of difficulty. Remember that you're not alone, that God is with you. We have a Father in heaven who's watching over us and who's holding us close. 
The Son of God is walking right beside you to carry you. The Holy Spirit is dwelling in your heart to give you strength. The child of God is never alone. I feel like we've, we've made that point several times in our study. We're not alone. We're not alone. And Jesus is telling his disciples that over and over again. But it bears repeating because it's so easy for us to forget. It's so, so easy to lose sight of that. Our mind can go to some pretty dark places when we're suffering. And we start to believe things that just aren't true. And we have this self-talk going on in our mind. And we say things like, no one cares. I'm all alone here. Nobody calls me anymore. Nobody ever stops over to see how I'm doing. They just abandon me. Is there anybody who cares about me? Nobody wants to know how I'm doing. I'm just alone here. And we tell ourselves that. We start to believe that, even though it isn't true. If we're honest, most of the time, there's probably at least a dozen people in your life who are there who would drop everything to be there in an instant if you reached out to them. But even if it was true, and you were all alone in this world, you still wouldn't be alone. The Lord will never leave us alone. In Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, God comforted His people in the adversities they were going through. And He said, Do not fear, I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, surely I will help you, surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Well, those are words that we can hold on to in our difficulties. God says, I am with you, I will uphold you with my mighty right hand. When it feels like everything is chaotic and unsettled and falling apart, there's always one thing you can count on, and that is the Lord is there. In the New Testament, the life of an apostle could be pretty lonely. In the Old Testament, the life of a prophet could be really, really lonely. And, and I think of one man in particular who really felt that and, and just really ached in his heart, that loneliness, being faithful to the Lord in a culture that, that didn't care about the Lord and that rejected the Lord. A man named Elijah went through some times in his life. He stood so firm. He stood so faithful. He was so bold and passionate. He found strength in God, but there was a moment where he reached his breaking point, and his life was threatened, and he ran as, as far away as he could, and he collapsed. And the Lord reached out to him there and said, what are you doing here? Why are you here, Elijah? And, and he complained. He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant and broken down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. And we can hear the loneliness in his voice, the anguish in his voice. He felt like it was just him against the whole world. There was nobody there to stand beside him. And God ministered to him. Elijah, you're not alone. Don't you remember? You were in the wilderness, and I took care of you there. Don't you remember? You know, like... It, this isn't the first time the king has tried to kill you. I, I've always protected you. But God would go on and, and tell him, you know, there's others. You're not the only one. There's still 7,000 faithful men who have not bowed their knees to Baal. So God encouraged him and reminded him that he wasn't alone in that hour of desperation. And God was going to supply a friend. He would go and, and raise up Elisha, the young man who would become the prophet that would carry the torch after him, and he would find strength in the Lord and in others. And maybe you feel like Elijah, and you complain, I'm alone here, Lord. There's nobody to walk beside me. It's too much for me to carry on my own. You need to hear, you're not alone. You're never alone. The Lord is with you. Your brothers and sisters in Christ are there for you. And you're not alone. Elijah wasn't alone. And Jesus wasn't alone. And his disciples wouldn't be alone. And you're not alone. So when you have that conversation in your mind, nobody's with you, nobody cares. Just kind of rebuke that thought and say, hey, that's not true. And maybe pick up the phone at that moment and go call somebody. Call a friend, call a family member. Say, hey, let's call and see how you're doing. Can you pray for me? And who knows? Maybe they need to hear 
your voice. Maybe your voice will be a voice of encouragement. Maybe they feel alone too. But you're not alone. You're never alone. God is there. And when troubles come, and they will, find peace in Jesus. Find peace in Him. Go back to our passage of John 16 and verse 33. Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. That's a wonderful word, isn't it? Peace. We tend to think of peace as the absence of conflict, the absence of chaos and turmoil and, and troubles, to be undisturbed by commotion, to be in a place where everything's calm and tranquil and safe. That's what we, we, how we tend to define that word. You might picture a, a scene, an idyllic scene beside a, a gentle river, and you can hear the water just kind of trickling through the rocks, and there's a leaf that's kind of lazily floating by and just disappears around the bend, and, and the wind is just gently blowing some warm breeze on your face, and it makes the branches of the trees kind of dance back and forth. Oh, that, don't fall asleep here. <laughs> the songbirds are, are gracing you with their music. It's also peaceful and wonderful, but, you know, that is peaceful, but that's really not the Bible's definition of peace. It doesn't mean being taken out of turmoil and, and having the problems put away, and then, then you can have peace. No, no, the Bible talks about having peace in the midst of troubles, in the midst of the chaos, in the middle of the troubles. We can find secure security in His arms. We can rest in Christ. The word peace is used often in the Bible. In the New Testament alone, it's found about a hundred times. It conveys the idea of soundness, fullness, spiritual well-being, which is something that can only be found in Christ. And theologians have, have described three types of peace. If you were to look up every reference in the New Testament to the word peace, probably would fit into one of these three categories. There's peace with God, and there's peace with others, and then there's the peace of God. And peace with God is what we find when we come to know Christ as Savior, and we're forgiven, we're no longer enemies. He, he takes these rebellious hearts of ours, they're hardened against Him because of sin, and He melts those hearts, and, and He brings us into fellowship with the Father. And that is peace with God. We are reconciled to God the Father through Jesus the Son. And then we have peace with others, and the Lord changes the way that we relate to one another, and he, and he takes people from all different backgrounds and walks of life, and he brings us together as one in Christ, as brothers and sisters, as we, we come to faith in the Lord, we become brothers and sisters in Christ. We're no longer at odds, but we have peace with one another through Christ. And then there's the peace of God. As we encounter challenges and adversities, and, and, and we find that we're able to rest in Him. And we look to Him to get us through. And he, he doesn't promise to take away those problems or to make everything smooth, but he promises to walk beside us through those troubles and sustain us. And that's a, this third type of peace is, is what Jesus is describing here, the peace of God that we're able to experience in the midst of our troubles. He makes a similar statement. If you turn back to John 14, it's a page or two back, to John 14, verse 27, Jesus has already spoken of of this peace. We skipped over this verse earlier because I knew we would come back to it. But John 14, 27. He says, he says this. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives peace do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled. Nor let it be fearful. Well, it's, it's understandable these men would be feeling fearful and anxious and worried that evening as, as Jesus is telling them these things that they don't understand. And he's talking about going away and he's, and he's talking about his death and, and, and all of these things are worrying them and they feel, they feel that anxiety welling up from within them. From an earthly perspective, that was more than enough reason to be afraid. But he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Nor let it be fearful. I'm sure they're wondering, how are we supposed to do that? How, how can we not be afraid, Lord? He says, trust in me. Put your trust in me. Stand in me. That's where peace is found. And there are many situations where we would be fearful, where it would be perfectly natural for us to be worried and afraid and anxious. 
Jesus tells us, don't, don't let your, your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid. Find peace in Him. And maybe uh, well, all of us, we've all seen a little baby resting secure in his mother's arms. And just sleeping. Just resting so, so gently there. Oblivious to the world around them. And maybe there's a terrible storm going on outside. And then the thunder is just loud. And the lightning is flashing. And the rain is, is pouring. And the wind is howling. And everybody's looking out the window saying, oh, when is this storm going to pass by? How much longer is it going to be? But in the midst of that storm, there's this little baby resting secure in her mother's arms. There she's, she's right where she wants to be. Right where she knows that she's safe. Peace is resting in the arms of God. And we're not pretending that our problems are small or that we are great, but we know that He's much bigger than all the problems that we will face. And if He's holding on to us, that's all we need to know. And we have no reason to be afraid. He offers a very different type of peace than what the world offers. He says, I give to you, not as the world gives. Jesus gives us real peace. There's a lot of people who, who cope with stress in a lot of different ways. And we could, we could run to different ways of coping with, with our worries. And some try to find it in a bottle, trying to drink their sorrows away. But when they sober up, the problems are still there. Maybe some new ones. Or maybe we pick up the TV remote and just try to zone out for a couple of hours, just forget about our problems. But when the credits are rolling... We come back to the real world and our real troubles. And those problems didn't, even, didn't actually go away. Or maybe we try to find peace and buy, try to buy it at the shopping mall, go on a shopping spree and think, oh, all these things are going to just really take my mind in a different place. But those new things that we've carried home aren't new for very long. And then we get the bill in the mail and there's a whole other set of reasons to worry. We can't buy peace. The world can't offer lasting peace through any of those distractions. But Jesus offers real peace, not as the world gives. As we draw close to him in prayer, he calms our anxious hearts. He doesn't change our circumstances all the time. But he always changes our perspective. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, Paul says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension. A peace that you probably never thought possible. How can I have that peace? Only in Him. What do we do when, when the troubles of life shake us? We can go to God in prayer, rest in Him. Prayer changes our focus. As long as we're focused on our problems, we can't have peace. If we're thinking, well, what am I going to do here? How am I going to fix this? And, and boy, what if this happens? There's no peace there. We put our focus on Him and bring our problems to Him. And that's where we find peace. And we do that over and over and over again. As those troubles come and those worries come, we keep going back to Him and keep finding His peace. We remember that God is sovereign. He is wise. He is powerful. He is good, He is faithful, and He loves us. He's given us a hope and a future, and so we find peace in Him. I was reading some different things this week, and there was a, an author who shared her experience. And she, and she says, I, I never put too much emphasis on a word for the year, but this year I felt like God gave me a specific word, rest. Not as in naps, but resting in who He is. I'm in the middle of a real and raw place right now where pain and peace could exist. I didn't think that could happen, but it can. And tears can fall and peace can rise simultaneously. I think this is what it feels like to rest under the shadow of the Almighty in the midst of hard times. Praise and worship might sound counterintuitive in the midst of pain, but it's what's brought healing to my heart. It is safe to trust in God even when it hurts. As I've been thinking back over these last few months, I can see why God gave me the word rest. He knew what was up ahead. He knew what I needed to be ready. He knows what you need, too. He does go before us. Just as it says in Deuteronomy 31a, it is the Lord who goes before you. So we don't need to live scared or afraid of the unknown because He is already preparing us. He's merciful. He 
compassionate, kind, all-knowing, and full of love, and we can trust him. These are the words of someone who's going through some pretty big troubles, some pretty big storms of life, but in the midst of it all, she found peace, resting in the arms of God. When troubles come, we need to cling to the victory that Christ has won. Cling to his victory. We go back to the second part of, of John 16, 33. Jesus, Jesus goes on to tell his disciples, In the world you have tribulation. But take courage. I have overcome the world. The powerful state. I have overcome the world. That's exactly what they needed to hear in that moment. In a very short time, they would endure what would seem like the greatest defeat of their lives. The soldiers came to the garden a little later that evening and took Jesus away. And all they could do was watch. They felt helpless and weak and small and inadequate. How could this happen? It didn't make any sense. He's the Messiah, the Savior of the world. How could they lead him to the cross to crucify him? They saw all the hatred of the world unleashed on him. And all the fury of hell raged against him. It was the darkest day the world has ever seen. From where they were standing, this didn't look like a victory, but a terrible, terrible failure. It seemed like evil triumphed over good. But what they didn't realize is that this was all a part of his plan. They should have. He told them. That's what he was telling them here in our passage. It's all a part of his plan. But it wasn't until later that they could look back and see and understand. The path to victory led through the cross. And that's where he paid the debt for our sin. It's where he accomplished our salvation. For three days, the disciples hung their heads in defeat. And they believed that all was lost. And then everything changed. The morning of the third day, when he appeared before their eyes, risen alive, triumphing over the grave. And they would remember those words. Take courage. I have overcome the world. He was telling the disciples and telling us that because we are united with him, we share in his victory. So whatever trials come our way, whatever problems we have to face, whatever the world might throw at you, whatever schemes the devil can hatch, through all of those things, the child of God triumphs in Christ. He's already secured the victory. The word that he uses here in our passage con means conquer, prevail, be victorious, triumph. And the tense of that verb is significant. He doesn't use the future tense, which we might expect. I will someday overcome the world. He uses what's called the perfect tense, which means something that happened in the past, but the results continue. All the way up to our experience in the present. I have conquered. I have prevailed. I have overcome the world. I conquered the cross. And the results of his victory extend to our lives today. It's true. There are still battles to be fought. And we fight them daily. There are obstacles that we face. We face them every day. But we go forward. As conquerors in Christ. And that's why the Apostle Paul can write in Romans chapter 8, verses 37 to 39. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor any other thing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. There is a final victory that is waiting in the future. There's a future day when he will triumph once and for all over all his foes, over the forces of darkness, over the, the nations. He will cast the devil into the lake of fire. He will fix all that is broken and make all things new and wipe away every tear. We long for that day. But the victory is already here. It's already secure. It's already certain because of what he did on the cross, and at the empty tomb. And that's why the Bible declares that we are more than conquerors. 
doesn't say we will be more than conquerors one day. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, sadly, I don't watch nearly as much football as I used to. I didn't even watch Penn State or Ohio State play yesterday, so I know that's kind of like blasphemy. I have to repent of my sin here. <laughs> I did check on the score as I was as I was working and got a little anxious there for a little while. <laughs> but what I do try to do is if there's a really good game, I try to go back and watch the replay. And it's kind of nice to go back and watch it without any commercials. And I, I'm, I'm probably going to do that this week for sure. But one of the nice things about doing that is it, it takes all that anxiety, that nervousness away. Like, I'm sure if I was watching it live, I would have been on the edge of the seat. Like, okay, what are they going to do now? All right, are they going to score here? How are they, how are they going to stop these guys? What's, you know, and you know that anxiety. But when you already know what the outcome is, you can watch and you have confidence. Hey, there'll be some tense moments. I don't know how they're going to pull the game out, but they will because it's in the books. It's already written. It's finished. It's established. The record is there. We prevailed, right? We won. Victory. And so I can watch, and yeah, there'll be those kind of nervous moments. Uh oh, probably what's going to happen? But I know the outcome. And the same is true for us in our Christian life. We don't, we don't, have, to, we don't have to worry and stew and hang our heads when trials come. When it seems too great for us to carry when we don't know what the answer is, we know, one way or another, God is going to carry us through. We know what the outcome will be. And sometimes, as we turn on the news, as we pick up the paper, it looks like, in our perspective, this earthly perspective, it looks like the forces of darkness are winning. The world is spiraling out of control, but we know what the final outcome will be. We know the score. And we know we're on the winning team. Christ has already overcome the world. He came, and he's coming again, and our future is certain. So we prevail in him. We face every struggle, not, not knowing how it's going to turn out, but knowing that he will give us the victory one way or another. And that changes everything. We need to hold on to that, because if we forget that, then we'll start to, to live as if we're on the losing side. And there are too many Christians walking around with their heads hanging. Woe is me. What's going on here? How can things get any worse than this? What are we going to do? We don't have to live that way. Stop living in defeat. Stop hanging your head. Because we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. There's so many things that I don't understand that happen in my life. But I know this. Our Savior has come. He's coming again. And that means the future is certain. Our hope is secure. I can face every trial that comes my way with confidence, knowing that he will give me the victory. Christian author Warren Wiersbe says this. He says, John 16.33 is the summary and climax of the upper room message. Why did he give this message? So the disciples would have peace in a world of tribulation. Note the contrast between in me and in the world. In Christ there is peace. In the world there is tribulation. This is the position we need to claim. Are we in Christ and therefore we can overcome the world and all of its hatred? In ourselves we have nothing. But in Christ we have all that we need. So this morning, what troubles are you facing? What trials are afflicting you? What struggles have been weighing on your shoulders? What problems have seemed insurmountable? Maybe it seems like you've been given more than your share. Maybe, maybe you have. But we all, we all face troubles in one form or another. Jesus says, take heart, for I have overcome the world. And we believe that in our heart this morning. If so, let us go forth in victory. And I'm not saying it'll be easy. The path that Jesus followed led him through the cross before he got to the empty tomb. The path that the apostles followed would take them to prison cells and, and, and some pretty dark places. Too much for them to handle on their own, but they weren't alone. God was with them, and he's with us, and he'll bring us through. It's never been easy to follow Jesus faithfully, but he always stands by his people. And he'll carry you through. 
And he gives us peace. We can understand what peace really is. We, we don't really understand peace until we face those troubles and find strength in the Lord and rest secure in his arms. That's where we feel real peace. The world can offer temporary distractions. They can't give you peace. And so trust in him. Allow him to lead you in victory. Remember what the score is. The battle has already been won. There is trouble in this world. But take courage because Christ has overcome the world.